I'm back for part three of the Kenwood R2000 restoration series. And the first thing I did, strangely enough, was put it all back together. And the reason was because four years ago I took it apart and I put various screws and the control knobs and so on in boxes and plastic bags. And I wanted to make sure that before I start disassembling and repairing it, I actually have everything and I know how to put it back together. So obviously there was the top to go on, which couldn't go on until I removed the umbilical wires for the new display. And that has eight screws and then all the knobs. And then I, there are three holes in the back, which I'm not sure if the screws were lost before I had it or if I lost them, but I don't think they're critical, they're only small. And otherwise it all seems to have gone back together nicely. And actually it looks great as it is it looks a bit tired and grubby and even though it wasn't fully functional I enjoyed using it when I was testing it I like the front panel interface the buttons the change of uh, one megahertz to go through the bands the tuning which is slow medium or fast it all works really well and it's nice to use and it was originally intended to be portable and although that might seem a little bit bring a bit of a smile to our face I suppose these days with modern equipment it's actually quite practical it's a reasonable size and weight and it is quite easy to lift and you could pick this up and carry it around put it in your car for example and take it on a field expedition and on the back there's an input for an external power maybe from a car or from a car battery in those days and uh, there's the mains obviously American or English there's a remote connection and uh, a plug for the VHF converter. I'm not sure what that's all about. Two antenna inputs, 50 ohms or 500 ohms and another antenna input. And then I removed this access panel earlier today and there's loads of room inside. I think that's something to do with adding a VHF module, although I might be wrong. Um, but luckily I was sent uh, a service manual and that's actually a collection of sheets. It's been very well copied. I wonder if it came originally from the factory. Uh, it was looking a bit rough with rusty staples and so on. So I've cleaned it up and put it in a folder. But looking through it before I started with this today, I found a brilliant diagram of disassembly, which I'll put on the screen in a moment. And that's fantastic because it shows me exactly which screws to remove and what goes where and how to get the front panel off and so on and one very encouraging thing I noticed in that diagram is that behind this front panel is a sub assembly a sub assembly that holds these buttons so these are the buttons that I really need to get behind to make them work and test them so I'm hoping that sub assembly will make that much easier for me so the next step is to look once again at the manual, the diagram for disassembly, and to start removing the top panel, the PCB and so on, and start cleaning the whole thing up and restoring it. And I hope at the end of this video to be able to show this same scene again, but with a more sparkly, refreshed looking radio, with all the buttons working, and with a lovely shiny new green LED display behind this window. Okay then, so let's start again. I'll take the knobs off once more. Now I know that I have them all. I'm putting everything into a container so I know where it's going. So now I think I'm going to see if it's possible to remove the front cover before I do anything else. To remove the front cover, I had to also remove the top and bottom covers. Both of these are independently removable and are simply held on with screws. There are two fastenings to watch out for though on the front cover. One is the longer screw behind the tuning knob and the other is the nut holding the frequency and clock switch and this is recessed into the front cover and has a couple of notches on the top. Presumably there's a specialist tool for this, but I used two small screwdrivers and that worked well enough. Once I'd removed the front cover, I then had to retrieve the mode buttons which fit inside it. <laughs> 
Now I could see the sub panel holding the faulty buttons, which looked very dirty and corroded. I gave them an initial spray of contact cleaner so that it could start working its magic, and then I continued with the disassembly. The receiver has two main PCBs, upper and lower. They're effectively back to back on the chassis, and they're joined by four coaxial cables which run through holes in the chassis from top to bottom. These cables were very dirty and sticky, and I removed them after making a careful diagram of their connections, as a mistaken reconnection could be very damaging. Joining the two PCBs together and to the various controls and subboards is an extensive wiring loom, <laughs> which reminded me of the kind of thing you would see in an older style car. There are a great many connectors which had to be released and I photographed them extensively from multiple angles to make sure I could complete the reconnection fully and accurately. Over time, the wires had stiffened so that they were retaining their shape and direction somewhat and that was going to be a great help during reassembly. The PCBs are held to the chassis with multiple screws which run through metal standoffs. I removed the top PCB first, having disconnected all the wires plugged into it, and I removed the screws which held various sockets onto the back panel. I followed a similar procedure with the lower PCB, and to remove it I had to detach the attenuator switch from the sub-panel as I was not sure if the lead on that was releasable and I didn't want to risk breaking anything. I was really pleased to see that the optional CW filter was installed as well. With the two PCBs removed and safely put to one side, I continued to disassemble the receiver. Removing the chassis and releasing the sub-panel was a significant moment. The radio is about 40 years old. It had been kept in a loft and also in a humid climate, so it was full of thick dust and grime, especially in the top section. I simply cleaned all the metal casing parts and the front panel with soap and water using soft brushes and swabs, and then I left them to dry while I worked on the PCBs and fixing the faults. It was very satisfying to see everything looking so clean. The most important technical aspect of the restoration was to get the switches and LEDs working again. I decided not to try and remove the circuit board completely, as that would have meant removing all of the controls and wiring, which could have been very difficult to handle. So I released the screws and pulled the board out just as much as necessary for cleaning and soldering. I also cleaned each control and switch individually removing some of them as I went, and I also cleaned the wires. The switches took a lot of work to revive. They were heavily corroded, so I cleaned them with isopropyl alcohol, swabs and cloths, and repeatedly sprayed them with contact cleaner, working them on and off multiple times. I tested them with multimeter probes on their legs, and also on the back of the PCB, and eventually after resoldering some of the connections, I was hopeful that they would all work. I tested the LEDs with probes from a power supply, current limited to 20 milliamps and with just a couple of volts. Three of them seemed to be defective, so I removed them and tested them again out of circuit. I had to replace them, and as I didn't have any of the special LEDs that fit into the holes in the cover, I used three millimeter round ones and set them a little lower to give enough space for the cover to fit back on over them. The LED pads on the PCB also needed resoldering and cleaning up, and one was too corroded to use, so I had to reconnect it to ground. I tested them again, applying the low voltage to the solder points, and then I hoped that when the cover was on, they would light up when the switch is pressed and look appropriate. The second major repair was to add a new frequency display. Having tested the seven segment LEDs extensively, I now joined them into one unit by soldering wires between the segment pins and then added connector wires by sliding on DuPont connectors without their plastic covers and securing them with a dab of solder. I followed this up with heat shrink to make sure the contacts did not short and then I tested the whole assembly again and labelled all of the connections.
I used black and green for the two sets of cathodes and then a different colour wire for each segment lead. I left the female end of the DuPont leads ready to connect to the display PCB which I showed in part 2 of this video. To fit the new display into the subpanel, I first loosened the transparent assembly and cleaned it thoroughly with isopropyl alcohol. I then made a 3D printed bracket which held the two LED blocks together and spaced them appropriately in the window. Luckily this only took a few attempts to get the dimensions correct. To fix the new display in place I used the kind of glue that holds mobile phone screens and first secured the plastic bracket and then the LED blocks. They were a push fit and then secured on their sides so there was no chance of any of the glue reaching the window and if necessary this assembly should be easily removable in the future. I cleaned all the corrosion from the metal of the sub panel while fixing the switches. So now the display was in place I had a sub panel that was clean, fully working and ready for refitting into the receiver chassis. I cleaned the PCBs with isopropyl alcohol using soft brushes and cotton swabs. The upper one was particularly grimy and the metal covers were corroded. I cleaned these with fine abrasive paper making sure to contain and clean away any dust. There were several components attached to heat sinks so I detached them carefully, cleaned them up and renewed the thermal paste. I had to be very careful not to damage the PCB in the process. Now all the parts were cleaned and hopefully repaired so I laid everything out for a final check before starting the reassembly process. Before fitting the top and lower PCBs I needed to work out a way of securing the new board that links the seven segment display. After some consideration I decided to replace one of the PCB securing screws with a long 3mm bolt. I had to drill out the thread in the chassis and offer the bolt up from underneath. It passed through the standoff in the upper PCB and then secured onto the top of the display board between two locking nuts. The lower one was acting as a height stop. When all the assembly was complete I cut off the excess bolt length carefully protecting the components underneath. Long before that was going to happen though most of the reassembly needed to take place including putting some of the plugs with wires on underneath that board and in preparation for that I mounted the upper PCB onto the chassis. I was very appreciative of some help with the rejoining of the sub panel to the chassis. Firstly I fed the 17 display wires through the bracket on the PCB and then we gradually moved the two chassis parts together while making sure that the wiring loom connectors moved above or below the chassis as appropriate. The wires made everything a bit springy but once we started to fit the four screws everything seemed happy to join together again. The comprehensive collection of pictures I had taken earlier helped tremendously with the reconnection and I displayed them on my laptop while plugging everything back into the board. I fitted everything to the upper PCB then fitted the lower PCB to the chassis and reconnected as much as possible to that board as well. Signals passed between the two PCBs via four coax cables which I showed earlier in a very dirty state. These were now clean and ready for refitting so I carefully consulted the chart that I'd made earlier in the process and it was very satisfying to see them back in place. I refitted the sockets and switches that were removed for cleaning from the panels and also reinstated the power supply onto the lower chassis. Then I was able to put everything back together to the point where the receiver could be powered up and tested. Holding back the fitting of the front cover which I thought may be a bit difficult until I was sure everything worked. So now let's see what happened when I tested the newly rebuilt R2000 receiver. AM, FM, SSB, LSB, CW. Buttons beeping away, all these lights beeping away, and uh, 
all the memory buttons work and I can do a program scan I believe. There we are and back to number one. So so far so good everything's working I'm absolutely delighted with the display I think it's all going to fit inside the case so in a moment I'm going to put it all back together hopefully get the faceplate on nicely so let's see how it looks when the whole radio is back together. Okay, so here it is. And I said at the beginning of this little series that I hope to be back with a fully working radio with a new bright clear display and all the buttons working and all the lights changing appropriately. And here it is. Some of them are now different colors. So I'm absolutely delighted with this radio. It's working really well. I have the case fully on. Everything's clean and uh, nice to use. And some good features include the memories, which remember not only the frequency, but also the mode. A very good narrow filter for CW. I was lucky to find that in there already included. So I'm delighted with it. I might do a couple of small modifications. I think I might put a fused switched power input on the back because I don't particularly like the idea of plugging any device in and as soon as it's connected to the mains it's connected forever. And the other thing I may do is replace the 13.8 volt socket with a more modern tubular one such as we use in most of our radios today. Other than that it's absolutely fine. I'm thrilled to bits with it and I'm planning to use it for Lots of shortwave listening and also to team it up perhaps with a QRP transmitter, maybe one watt, maybe five watts and synchronize it as you can do with just a receiver and a transmitter instead of an all-in-one box transceiver. So I hope you've enjoyed these videos. I hope you found it interesting. I've had a fantastic time undertaking this restoration. I found it very educational and great fun little project each day until it's all finished and uh, I'll be back with more videos soon about amateur radio technology and electronics so thanks for watching